Good morning, friends, and welcome to our program today. I'm Dr. Willie Nub with San Jose Word of Faith Christian Center. Uh, this is indeed a jubilant day um, with uh, the presidential election over. Hopefully you're pleased with the results, but uh, I, I'm very happy with uh, what's happening in the world. A lot of uh, jubilation, people out and enjoying themselves again. Look like people that went into hiding for uh, a while there. So I, I, I really like seeing people happy, enjoying one another. And certainly I'm uplifted today, and I trust that you're uplifted today in Jesus' name. We're going to move into another message today um, entitled Accessing the Rivers of Living Waters. Accessing the Rivers of Living Waters. A question that uh, believers have struggled with from time immemorial, immemorial is um, how to fully uh, access all of the promises contained in the Word of God. Today I would like to address the question and provide uh, some direction on how to access the Lord's promises. The Lord knew we would have uh, these questions, and a lot of us have those questions, um, waiting in anticipation for the results of the presidential election. And so he began to direct uh, us in, the, in answering that question by looking at the early saints. And uh, I have an excerpt that I'm just going to add to the message. Uh, I was just prompted to do that. I'm going to uh, direct you to Luke, the uh, uh, 18th chapter, verses 1, uh, and we're going to read a few of the verses. Uh, I felt it was appropriate to insert this. Uh, this morning I was prompted to do so. I'm going to read most of it from the Amplified Version for clarity's sake. And it's in, again, Luke, the 18th chapter, uh, verse 1. And this is one of the early saints back during the time of Christ. It says, also, Jesus is speaking here, giving us an, a, a parable, an example uh, I guess I'll reserve saying it's a parable or not until we get to the end. Because, um, And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that uh, uh, they ought to always pray and not to turn coward, faint, lose heart, and give up. Of course, in the King James Version it says, and uh, not to faint. And uh, saying the following second verse, I'm going to read this from the uh, old King James. Uh, there was, so it's not a parable, it's that there was in a city a judge. Y'all see how I made that distinction? Uh, sometimes we jump to conclusions, but if Jesus said it was not a parable, there was a person, they actually existed. So we can't, we have no right to call it a parable. So I retract what was said earlier. Let me read again from the King James Version. Uh, it said, make sure, that be, that's how we get misled. Things that are put in by interpretations that are not merited by what the text says. The first verse. And he spake a parable, it shouldn't even be, a, well, it's a parable, it's an example. But watch this. And then he clears it up in the second verse. And to them, to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. Now, this it's a parable, but it's an actual person. Watch, look at the second verse. There was in a city a judge. So if the Lord said it was a judge in a particular city, this is a real life example that he's sharing. It is a parable from the vantage point that he's given us information that will direct us on uh, how we're to govern our lives and how we're to interpret scripture. But in the second verse it says, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. Look at the third verse. Praise the Lord. Then he says there in the third verse, There was a widow in that city. So there was a widow who actually lived in this city. And uh, she came into him, unto him, saying, Avenge me of my ad, my adversaries. And basically what that means is, if you look at the Amplified, they have this right, protect and defend and give me justice against my adversaries. A lot of us have adversaries and we ask the Lord to help us uh, to intervene. And that's what many of us have been doing for the last few years, ask the Lord to in intervene and to help us. And the question that comes to mind is, why is it taking so long for the Lord to give me the results that I've asked for? Look at the fourth verse. And he would not for a while, so this unjust judge would not uh, assist a woman, an avenger of her adversaries for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, though I fear not God, notice that. He said he fears not God, um, nor regard man. So we had, uh, we've had some individuals that are in position of leadership who didn't appear to fear any man. Most of the time men feared him because of the wealth and authority that the person had. And uh, didn't care much about God because of the way that he was governing his uh, leadership uh, that uh, 
called everything by the way he saw it, not the way the Lord would have him do it, and certainly didn't live uh, or administer uh, that which God had given him in accordance with the Word of God. And unfortunately, as believers, that we, need, we have a responsibility when we're assessing whether one is of God or whether one is an unjust judge, uh, we need to use scriptures. We don't uh, leave people, uh, allow them to be judged outside the scriptures. So whether they're a politician, whether they're a mayor, whether there's uh, a boss on the job, if they're not doing things in accordance with scriptural values, what the Bible has said in the word of God, all of the scriptures, then uh, we have to come to the conclusion that they're not of God, that they're just part of this uh, cosmos a man's way of doing things is just an individual, a person living here in this uh, world. And we don't expect those in some of those positions to actually be uh, of the clergy, that the clerics, that they're going to do things right according to the clergy. But we do want them to do things, especially if we as believers are going to subscribe to their beliefs and subscribe to what they're doing. We need to make sure that uh, the majority, at least, of what they're doing is in sync with the Word of God, especially the love wall. You know, that's the primary thing that governs how we live as believers. And the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians actually get in, gets into that in detail and from just about every vantage point you can imagine. And for those of you who have been uh, supporting someone who uh, doesn't agree with any one of those scriptures, you go to every one of those scriptures that are in that particular chapter, and if the person fails on every single one of them, they need to be kicked to the curb. You need to find somebody else that you're going to support. Uh, and uh, that's what I would say to believers who uh, pick someone who does not adhere to any Christian values. And I say Christian values, I'm talking about biblical values, not what your values are, because we saw clearly that a lot of people are not adhering to what the Word says. And so uh, now we're at the end, at least at the beginning of something new and fresh. Make sure that you align yourself with those in leadership who have some semblance of Christianity in their life. And they may not be a Christian, but the things that they do line up pretty well with the love walk that is uh, espoused by the Apostle Paul in the uh, first uh, uh, Corinthians, the uh, uh, first chapter and throughout. And so let's make sure that we do that. Let me go to, uh, let me just go there right quick. Well, let me finish this up, the story. The fourth verse of uh, uh, Luke, the 18th chapter, 8 and 4. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, this guy has been asked to avenge her, this widow, of her adversaries to help her. The fifth verse, yet because the widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wear me out. She wears me. And so, um, although this is an unjust judge, he's saying because the woman kept coming and impressing upon me to do what is right, uh, I, I'm getting worn out, and so I'm going to respond to her and give her her request. Look at the fifth, uh, the uh, sixth verse. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Okay. Seventh verse. And shall not God, um, let's look at the sixth verse again. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Seventh verse. And shall not God avenge his own elects, which are cried to him day and night, uh, though he bear along with them? I'm reading from the King James Version. Look at the next verse. Um, verse 8. Just a minute. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, watch this, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. What he's saying at the end of this age when the Lord comes to gather up his people, the question is, how many people are going to be living by faith rather than by sight? And um, I, I find with the Lord, a lot of times he waits till the last second before he uh, reveals what it is that he's going to do. So that's where patience is in there. And we're going to be talking about that probably in some great detail in our actual sermon today. And so I'll wait until that time to really address the importance of patience when you ask the Lord to do something. But I wanted to just uh, show you here, this person didn't give up. This woman pressed until even the unjust judge gave her what she asked for. Praise God. Let's see what the ninth verse. And he spake this parable unto a certain who trusted uh, in themselves. So he goes on into it. But uh, notice this. I want to see where, don't he bear along with him. Let's go back here. Shall not avenge 
his own elect. I want to read that again. Though he bears means that although he's waiting. Yeah, seven verse. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry to him day and night, though he bears long with him. That means the Lord, even though he um, knows that we need this, uh, he bears with us as long as uh, we're pursuing him for the answer to our prayer. You know, the Bible says that there's uh, in First um, Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 13th verse, he says, no temptation taken you, but such as is coming to man. But the Lord is faithful, and I will allow you to be tested above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the point that's been made is that um, the Lord will not let you go beyond your ability to bear the challenge that is coming against you. And so same thing here in the seventh verse. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry to him day and night, though he dares that word again, bear long with them. Uh, notice it says long. <laughs> that means it may not be an instant response to your request, but he's not going to let you go beyond uh, your ability to bear the challenge that's coming against you. So that's what you have to do. Just keep on holding on until there's a full, full manifestation, which may be uh, one minute before 12 midnight. And uh, as we saw with uh, what has happened here with the elections that those been, of you who have been praying for. Let, let's go and uh, continue here. And the title of the message is Accessing the Rivers of Living Waters. And uh, there's another example that the Apostle Paul gives us from the saints that lived of old and the kind of challenges they went through as examples for us uh, that are living in this dispensation of grace. Uh, and, and I believe this is going to assist us in our uh, understanding, comprehending why God does things uh, the way that he does. Acts the third chapter and the 19th verse. Uh, the first thing that the Lord says in, in his promise to us, uh, the conditions that we must meet, and that's the part that most believers leave out, is that there are conditions that must be met in order to receive the bounty uh, that God has for us as believers. He says, repent, therefore, and the word repent that's used here is from the uh, Greek word metanoia, and uh, what it means is um, uh, to change your thinking. you got to change your thinking and align it with God's word and be converted. That's the second part. We need to change our thinking, and then we need to be converted. Praise the Lord. And I hope that's what you're doing. And uh, this is in Acts, the third chapter, verse 19, and I hope you're all with me. I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and I'm deciphering it uh, with the Greek as we go. Uh, the word converted is from the Greek word epistrepho. And it's really important for you to understand this, that you don't have to change your mind. And most importantly, uh, that word epistrepho, converted, means to change your behavior by turning about and moving in a different direction uh, in accordance with God's words, to move, more, to move towards God, to turn away from what you've been doing and turn towards the Lord and walk in that direction. It's, it's the, the course that you're following. It's a course that leads towards the Lord rather than when it leads towards the devil. That your sins, notice this, in order for your sins to be blotted out, you have to do two things. You have to repent, acknowledge that what you're involved in is not right, change your mind. And then the second thing is be converted, to change your walk and your direction and your behavior, the way you're going in. In order that, your sins may be blotted out. So they're not blotted out unless you do those two things, despite what you've heard in uh, denominational circles. So that the times are refreshing, and the second thing that you want to come your right way is a time of refreshing it may come from the presence of the Lord. So it's two things you have to do. Acknowledge that what you've been doing and practicing is not of God, and you're going to move away from that. Conversion means to uh, change your behavior to move in a, direct, a different direction. First you acknowledge that what you're doing is not right. Now I'm going to change my direction and walk in a different uh, path than the one that I have been walking in. And he said, and once you've done that, your sins will be plotted out. And uh, the time of refreshing, um, that it can be released and that it may come from the presence of the Lord. So if you want the time of refreshing and you need to be refreshed, it'll come after you've done what your responsibilities are. And by faith, we believe that God is going to fulfill his word in accordance with what he's just stated. And so that's where people mess up, too, is that they, they get concerned about looking at circumstances and situations rather than walking by faith. They're walking by sight rather than by faith. And so if you're a believer, you're going to have to walk by faith to believe that God is going to come around and fulfill what he has promised in his word based upon you meeting conditions. I know people in this this the time we're living in, try to throw away conditions. There's no, nothing you have to do. Just walk, come towards, walk, come towards the Lord. A whole host of things there. 
If you're walking towards the Lord, that means you love him and you're keeping his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Otherwise, you're walking in a different direction. You have not converted. You're still tied into the world system and trying to make it okay uh, uh, with the Lord that you're not uh, living in accordance with his holy writ. Praise the Lord. That's enough on that. In the previous verses, uh, the, the Apostle Peter is extending God's refreshing to stimulate He's preached this uh, shortly after the day of Pentecost in Acts, the third chapter, and the, the, the 19th verse, the one we just quoted. Uh, so uh, he says there was a refreshing to stimulate that the Lord has set aside for us, that he will make available to us and reveal to us if we do those things that are required for salvation, basically. Uplift, to inspire, to energize, to revitalize, and to quench the thirst of those whose lives have been marooned in a desert wasteland due to wrong choices. So a lot of people are marooned in a desert wasteland, uh, set aside, away from the Lord, uh, and uh, they have no, no idea that there's some additional things they can do um, where they can be uh, part of the bounty and the blessing and uh, the outpouring that's going to come from, from the Lord. All that is required to move in the proper direction is for one to repent. Although Peter did not specifically state it, the refreshing he is referring to is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which he had just exercised uh, in healing a crippled man. So in the chapter 3, at the very beginning of that chapter, you find him opening, uh, healing a man at the beautiful gate. And uh, he leaped and jumped, and the people watched and saw the supernatural manifestation of the power of God exhibited in the life of this man who had been uh, crippled for his whole life, not able to walk, begging at the beautiful gate of the temple. And then uh, he happens to stumble across uh, Peter and John. And uh, Peter said, The silver and gold have I, have I none, but such as I have given to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So what he had was an empowering of the Holy Ghost in his life. So he's telling the man there to rise up and walk. So he grabs him by the hand, and the man leaped, praise God, and began to walk. And it was a great celebration uh, from his life with his dancing around and the people watching to see that this person that had been crippled from his mother's womb was able to jump and leap and walk and receive the bounty that God had set aside for him. Praise the Lord. And uh, we see that uh, the apostle Isaiah, actually the prophet Isaiah, prophesied of the coming of the Holy Spirit, saying the following in Isaiah 28, verses 11 through 12, uh, King James Version. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming, 12th verse. To whom he said, this is the test, or this is the rest, excuse me, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they will not hear. So he's saying that the refreshing is the Holy Spirit, which is going to cause people to speak with a stammering a stammering tongue, and uh, uh, and that's the way he's going to speak to his people. Uh, it's going to be in another language, and so when people see that, they're going to say that's not of God. They're going to say it's demonic, you know. And that's what people are saying today. Many people who have not been taught in the things of God, they don't realize that that really is a manifestation of the uh, the rest that the Lord is talking about. When you speak in tongues, as the Spirit gives you utterance, then uh, that's an uh, examine. That is an example. Of the fact that you're being indwelled by the, the, the third person of the Godhead and you're speaking out under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I heard something this morning that was demonic. Uh, that The utterance came from the person's spirit, did not, uh, uh, from their soul, did not come from the Lord. And they tried to make it sound like it was from the Lord, but it was very clear uh, with the chanting that they were doing. It wasn't from God. It was uh, demonic gibberish that they had thought up. Uh, because they were familiar with hearing people speak with tongues and those kinds of things, and, and people took license and did things that really were not supported by scriptures. You know, if first thing you're down barking on all four, they own four and they're barking like a dog and they're calling that an anointing from God, uh, beware. And so it's a lot of things people do to try, in order to capture a crowd, to get people to follow them, that's not sanctioned by scripture. God does not act unseemly. He doesn't do stupid stuff. And uh, so you see something getting stupid, and getting beyond the purview of Scripture, and there's no example anywhere in the Word of God that was supported, uh, you need to beware. 
praise the Lord. Although it may be exciting, it's wonderful that our church, we have all these kind of uh, exotic type manifestations. Well, that's when the devil gets involved. Okay, so let's just make sure that we watch the people and make sure they're doing things right. Praise the Lord. Make sure everybody's muted, please. Uh, the 12th verse here, uh, Isaiah is confirming that this ties into what Peter has said, the third chapter and the 19th verse. It says in the 12th verse here for, from Isaiah speaking prophetically about things that are going to happen in the future. It says, to whom he said, this is a rest. So stammering lip and other tongue speaking to people is a rest. And that is that rest that he said will come if you repent. In other words, acknowledge that what you're doing is wrong and you're going to, by implication, you're going to change and start and walk in a different direction. In that, in order that, the refreshing, which we're, uh, Isaiah is speaking about here, can come from the presence of the Lord. This is the rest. There it is, right? It's very clear here. Wherewith ye shall make the weary to rest. And this is refreshing, yet they would not hear. He's saying that most people are going to reject it. See, it's demonic. And if you watch, folks, the majority of them do, unfortunately. The evidence that one has been baptized in the Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament was for one to have spoken in tongues as a spirit gives them utterance, not them uh, concocting a language and speaking it because uh, the soulish mind has taken it and they've been uh, maybe in a circle where people do speak in tongues and so they know how to say the word sort of, but uh, the unction is coming from their soul. Uh, it's not coming from the spirit, okay? So uh, you need to make sure. They, it's coming from the soul, from the vantage point. That that's something they learned, they've heard. And so they know how to articulate through their mind. So the soul goes down to the mind, they speak a word. And that's why words need to be tested and governed by those who spirit feel as to whether it came from God or not. And the other thing, I say a clear example is if a person speaking in tongues for an elongated period of time, that's a sure sign that they've gone beyond what God has given them. Most of the time in the Word of God, if you look at the Word of Wisdom, the Word of Knowledge, that's discussed in the book of Corinthians, um, the uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, the uh, 12th chapter, what you'll find there is uh, when there is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit where it talks about the Word. Of, it's, just, it's a fragmentary piece of information from the mind of God. A Word of Wisdom, fragmentary piece of information pertaining to wisdom from the mind of Christ. Now, if they go on for five minutes and ten minutes, uh, you need to be wary of that. You need to say, well, you know, they're talking too long. It, it says a word. It didn't say a sentence. It didn't say a whole paragraph. Now, they could talk for a sentence, but when they start getting in paragraphs on and on and on, it's a flesh. It's, a, it's an, an action of the flesh. It's not of the Lord. So, it's funny. It says a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. And uh, so, when they, people start talking too long and saying this is directly from God, uh, prophetically speaking in another tongue, then uh, we need to be wary of that kind of stuff. Or the same thing, I'd say, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, doesn't always have to be in tongues. It could be in the, the dialect of the person who's bringing or sharing a word, uh, a prophecy. A prophecy is another area. A word of prophecy. Praise the Lord. When they start getting way out there too far, too long, then, then we know that uh, the enemy has gotten in their flesh has gotten in the way. And so someone who's a prophet that's in the midst of someone who's uh, a leader, who's been filled with the Holy Spirit, can judge whether that is of God or whether it's of the flesh. Now, we don't, if people make mistakes, that happens until they grow. The Bible says growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some people go beyond that grace. They're so excited about the movement of God, they, they go too far and go too fast. They get beyond God, beyond what the Holy Spirit has to say. That's why a lot of these things require aging. You have to age in it to know how to hear and how to act and how to respond. That's why I said those who have certain gifts, they need to wait on their gifting. Praise God. You're saved and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. But there is a developmental period that's required for you to be able to, to do some of those things that you may see others doing. You've got to grow to that level. Praise the Lord. I trust you're listening to me today, getting it. Praise the Lord. So on the last day of the feast, uh, the Jewish feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, in the Word of God, the Lord Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit, the third person of the God has, as rivers of living waters. And the title of our message today is Accessing the Rivers of Living Waters, which implies how do you access the uh, Holy Spirit, which is described as rivers of living waters that would flow out of the innermost being 
of the believers, and he says this, that, that, that river is going to flow out of us. Rivers, multiple, you know, multiple streams of rivers are going to flow out of us uh, in John, the seventh chapter, verse 37 through 39. That's if you've heard, praise God, back to us, go back to Peter. You know, no scriptures of private interpretation. You know, one portion of the word interprets the other so that everything is done decently and in order. So Peter, he opened by saying, you know, if you repent, that means to all acknowledge in your mind that the things you were doing uh, were not in sync with the things of God. And, and by implication that you're going to change your thinking to something different, one that's in concert with the things that God, the, the word of God has espoused to us. And then be converted. It means you're going to go in a different, walk in a different direction. You're going to behave yourself differently. And you're going to behave it by implication in sync with the word of God. Then the refreshing of the Holy Spirit will flow up on you. So if you see somebody living and working like the, and working for the devil, doing things of the demonic, or living a lifestyle that is not in concert with the things of God, the, the word that they're speaking is demonic. It's, by, it's coming from, it's demonic because it's used by, it's used to, uh, to assist the enemy in the, the uh, seduction of those who uh, have not grown to a level in Christ Jesus where they can interpret and discern whether one is of God or not. And there's a lot of people like that. It's the enemy is always that way. He comes to deceive you before you get established in the things of God. That's why you need to read the Word, study the Word, meditate on the Word day and night to observe to do all that's written therein. Then thou shalt wait, make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. And the, the enemy is trying to interrupt your success in the things of God and even in the things in this world. Uh, the promises of God, you won't be able to access the way you should because the enemy is giving you a word that's taking you in a different direction that God does not sanction. So we need to make sure we grow and develop in the things of God so we can discern people who are not in sync with the Lord and discern people who may be in sync with the things of God so we can get a word from God rather than a word from the devil. Praise the Lord. So here on uh, John 7, 37, John 39 says, In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood in Christ, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 38 verse, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Jesus is also confirming the fact that the rivers of living water wants to flow out of us. 39 verse, But this spake he of the Holy Spirit, watch this, which they that believe on him should believe, should receive. Uh, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, Holy Spirit, both synonymous words, because Jesus was not glorified. And the glorification here is referring to him being uh, crucified on Calvary's cross, dying as the, uh, the sin for the earth and the sin for the Lord. So uh, he becomes the sin bearer is what he did when he died on Calvary's cross. And that's when he was glorified, when he did the will of the Father. And that's why he came to the earth to down the cross and to uh, establish eternal redemption for those who would embrace him as the Lord of their life. So once that was done, then the Holy Spirit was released. He said, that's why Jesus said that uh, I cannot leave. I said, uh, I have to leave now because if I leave, don't leave, then the, the comforter will not come. And uh, the comforter becomes the one that leads and guides us, the Holy Spirit because Christ is seated at the right hand of the majesty, the right hand of Father God in heaven, where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So from heaven, he still intercedes, intercedes as our advocate, but the one that's in the earth realm right now, directing us, helping us, and giving us a word, uh, is he said, he shall lead you and guide you into all truth. That's the Holy Spirit. Praise God. That's his charter, to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Now when we pray, we still pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit hears what the Father has to say and what the Son has to say. And they understand whether what we're requesting is in sync uh, with what the Godhead says. And so then he intercedes for us and helps us. Uh, if we, our, our, our articulation is not to the level that it should be uh, and in sync with the things of God, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring that words that we need or to just intervene when we're making a request. We think we need Z, and he knows we need A, but we're praying that the problem would get resolved. He goes to the Godhead on our behalf and asks the Father, especially if you're really trying to get something resolved. He asks the Father in, uh, in terms that he and, and the Son are in agreement with, so that we can see a manifestation. We, we think we need Z, but we really need A. And so that doesn't mean you don't ask the Lord for what you want. 
we, we, when we ask the Lord for something, we want to make sure it is sanctioned by the Holy Spirit, that he is in agreement with that. He said that that's why uh, in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, 26th verse, so we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with moanings and groanings that cannot be spoken in, in the, the dialect that you speak. And uh, I won't get into that today, but uh, yeah, he takes the, what we're formulating, the words that we're formulating, he puts it in a term, terminology and in verbiage that is acceptable to Father God so we can get a manifestation and an answer to our prayer that's acceptable here in the earth realm. Sometimes the answer to our prayer, you know, we want a promotion. I just use that as an example so no one gets lost here. You want, a, uh, you want a promotion on the job. You pray and ask the Lord to give you a promotion to position A. And, and the Lord knows there's going to be some problems with position A in about three months. You don't know that, but the Holy Spirit knows that. So instead of giving you position A, he may give you position C, and then he knows that it's going to take about six months and then after position C, he may take you to A, but he may not ever because A will never get you to where you really want to be. So uh, he'll give you a job, praise God, that will give you the money and give you the esteem and all of that. But it may not be the exact one that you want. But you're praying. And that's why when you pray, because he hasn't given you a special word that this is the only job you can take. We should pray, say, Father God, this is the kind of job that I want. You know, if there's something that's going to uh, be a problem for me that's coming up. Uh, that I don't see, that's why you're with me, to help me, to lead me, to guide me to all truth, uh, to look over the horizon and show me things to come. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So he'll show you and prompt your spirit if you're sensitive to him. He said, I don't think the Lord wants me to have A. He's going to lead me somewhere else different. He may not tell you until it happens. Uh, and I, you've heard my testimonies in the past. I thought I wanted A, and he took me to C or to D. And uh, uh, but ultimately you'll get to the level that you want. Really, what you want is more money and more respect uh, in the job. You're not necessarily that job, but you want a job where you're going to be able to have that's in the area what you've been developed in and you've learned, uh, which may have a different title, but it's the same kind of job. And the money is commensurate or even better. And the, the path after that job will lead you to something that's way better, whereas the first path may stop. You may get the path, that's the end of it. You don't grow anymore, you don't make any more money, you stay there forever. So that's why we need to always depend upon the leading of the Holy Spirit, to lead us and to guide us in all truth whatsoever you have commanded us. And I think I'm uh, out of time right now. Praise God. Go with God. We're going to open up the uh, phone lines for any questions that you might have. Uh, we'll continue where we left off uh, next week. God bless you. This is Dr. Witt. We'll leave that until then. Are there any questions? There may be. Give me a chance to turn on the other No problem. I hit it pretty quick, didn't I? <laughs> you unmute yourself if you have a question. Or if you just want to make a comment. No questions. I just want to wish everybody a good morning. <laughs> God bless good you, morning, brother. Huh? brother Chris. Good morning. Uh, I don't have a question, but Madison did. Yes. She said if a baby died in heaven, are they still a baby or are they an adult? Do they get a chance to grow up? That was Madison's yeah. question. That is an excellent question. Uh, I'll probably have to probe in the, the Word of God. But uh, um, a lot of people believe, these are theologians, they believe that the baby that dies uh, ends up being a full-grown person when they are uh, in heaven. Um, you know, the Bible says... Uh, uh, Jesus was holding the children and people were trying to shoo them away. You know, I think it's in the book of Matthew. He says, suffer the children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. But he's, he's double untaught there. He's saying that that doesn't necessarily mean that a baby will be in heaven, but it means that the attitudes and the attributes of a baby, you know, like a baby is, is mild and uh, truthful. When you become adults, we become deceptive. Whatever. So the characteristics of the baby is to be part of a believer, one of the beloved. So I, I really believe that the baby will be, I can, I can firmly say this, that uh, 
those that die as a baby will make it to heaven. Uh, and I believe they're um, uh, advanced to uh, 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 middle age or early age. Praise the Lord. Because, uh, see, there's no more aging once. Um, um, said the Bible, when it's talking about Jesus, and it's, uh, let me finish it. I'm just want to, okay, so you have enough. Jesus, when he um, went through his transformation, you know, after he died on Calvary's cross, he said that uh, our bodies will be just like his body that he had after his uh, resurrection from the dead. So I would tell you, Jesus was 33 years old when he died, okay? So if you want to take it to the ultimate, say, okay, he said, I'm going to be just like him when I go through the transformation. When my physical body is transformed into my spiritual body, uh, that my spiritual body will be just like his. It'll be like 33 years old. It'll be able to go through walls just like Jesus was. It'll be able to, when he rose from the dead, remember, he walked through walls and appeared, and then he walked through the wall and disappeared. And uh, then he ate fish with them on the seashore. And when he ate the fish, it didn't fall on the ground. It went and was digested. So then we're going to have the same kinds of bodies, a spirit and a body, tangible body, that uh, uh, will uh, allow us to live throughout the eternity of eternities. And plus we'll have the indwelling Holy Spirit. So um, people will be able to look and know that we're fully human. We won't be able to make the distinction just like the apostles didn't. So to answer your question, I believe that we will be 33 years old, just like Jesus, whether male or female, uh, and the gender goes away. So, um, but we're going to look like we did. So that means that uh, women look like women, men will look like men. And uh, even though we're in our glorified bodies as resurrected to saints, and we're going to be kings. The reason why we have to walk through walls and, and, and not and appear and disappear because we're going to be governing the whole world. And we may have to come up on people because they're not all saved at that point. And if you call me later on, I can tell you how they get saved. But there's going to be natural people living there. And so the king needs to manage his domain. So he's going to go certain places and appear, and they won't know that he'll look normal, just like everybody else. And then he's going to disappear and go back to wherever his, his throne is. That's talking about resurrected saints, because the saints will judge the world. And so I answered three questions. First of all, I believe he's going to, we're going to all be 33, all the babies are going to be 33 years old. And I go a step further. I think all the old people are going to revert. Thank God for that. From 74 Back to 33 years old. <laughs> That's how we will look. And then I believe that uh, the same, just like Christ, when we eat, food will stay in our stomach, won't fall on the ground, uh, because we are real people. We're not just spirit. Okay? And then the, uh, what was the other one? I think I've answered all the questions. Was that satisfactory? <laughs> I have something to say, Papa. Yes. Um, about the babies in heaven. Uh, yes. Madison tomorrow will like this one. Okay. If you, if you ever notice babies less than six months old, they always stare at the light. In mm -hmm. my 30 years of experience with children, I've noticed that. Yeah. And that's because there's something familiar, and that's God. Yeah, yeah, it is. They always stare at the light, yeah. and they always pay attention. They're always attracted to life. And I thought, why are they so attracted to life? I said, you know what? That's something they know. That's you, something they know. Yeah, the wickedness haven't got a chance to get into them yet. Uh that's uh, that's one reason why the Lord doesn't judge the babies like he judges us, because it's just like Adam and Eve in the garden. They were sort of like babies. They didn't know the difference between right and wrong. You know, all they knew was right. There was no wrong. There was no, no sin. There was no corruption in the world. Corruption was ushered in by Satan. So by Ra, remember we talked about Ra, there was no headaches, there was no pain. He said that's when they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and knowledge of good and evil, which meant they had knowledge of good. They had no knowledge of evil until they partook of that fruit. When they partook of the fruit, they had knowledge of evil. And babies don't have no uh, knowledge of good and evil. They can't comprehend. Jesus said of them, well, the Father God said of them in the book of Jonah, because Jonah was going to uh, Nineveh. He wanted to God to kill all of them because uh, they had slaughtered his people, the Israelis. You know, cutting the wounds of babies, uh, women's stomach open while they're carrying a baby and they let them die and fall on the ground and killing the women and just bludgeoning the people. These were the Assyrians and their capital city was Nineveh. And he was told to go there as a prophet of God. And he didn't want to go. He wanted the Lord to kill them all. Don't forgive them. Kill them all. And the Lord said this to him. Hey, I can't go through the whole story. I, I can, but we don't have time. I'll just say this. That the Lord said to him. What kind of God would I be? He says, there is, I think it was 200,000 babies. Except they don't know their right hand from the left. Praise God. 
And he said, what kind of God would I be if I slew those babies who don't know the right hand from the left hand because their parents were wicked? He said, I won't do that, Jonah. Do your job. Go and tell them about me. And they repented in sackcloth and ashes. I think God gave them another hundred and some years. And he came back and judged them because they, never, they didn't continue the things of God. So that's your question. The, yeah. Uh, Paul gets into it a little bit also. I'm going to go and I just simply say there's a point where sin comes in because we have the ability and the capacity to understand what's right and what's wrong. And then from that point on, we get judged. So even, even with kids, I don't think they really know, uh, like we talk about adults and our minors. A, a lot of the minors, uh, we think they're ready at 13, 14. No, they may. It depends on the person. It may vary. It might be 17 or 18. Uh, the Israelis didn't judge them until they were, I think, 20 or 21. I have to look at it. They were not adults until they were 20, 21. So what I'm saying, and even if they are judged, it's not going to be like other people. But I don't think any judgment takes place until there's knowledge and understanding of the things of God. And then there's a judgment. And that judgment is based upon what you know and what you've been exposed to, even if you're an adult. Uh, see, someone like me, I get the full, if I went to hell, I'd get the full flames and everything. But if somebody who's ignorant, dumb, and is poor, uh, who doesn't know, they're going to get beat with a few stripes, the Bible says. So everybody will get punished that don't make it to heaven. But the punishment for those that know is that the worm draft not. So not only are you burning, your consciousness, your rotten consciousness, because you knew better and you led a whole bunch of people to hell, you get tormented in your mind, plus also in the flesh, the body that God creates for you so you can endure the punishment of hell for eternity of eternities. Does that help us? <laughs> Did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Good morning, Pastor. This is Brother Holiday. Good yes. morning, Pastor. This How you doing, Holiday. brother? I, I'm yes. going to make this real short because I know you got to go. we got to continue on with service. But yeah. I, I was reading in uh, one of the scriptures. I thought it was um, uh, Hebrews 11 because it's full. The, the entire chapter is all testimony about faith. Yes. And, and I read somewhere in in the Bible, someplace, uh, I don't remember if it was my notes or if it was in the Bible, but it spoke of faith as like an entity, like it almost has its own substance. And, and, and I was drawn to that, and I, and, and I forgot to write down my thoughts about that. And I was wondering if you knew any scripture that, that speaks of faith in that way. No, faith is... It, it, it really opened my eyes. And, and if you have a scripture that I can go to that I can uh, read, yeah. that I can uh, um, recapture my thoughts on that, it, it, it would really help. But if not, then maybe sometime later on down the line, Pastor. Uh, I guess right now, faith is not a person. It's not a personality. I understand. Okay. I understand. It's just like love. Yeah, but let me tell you why I, I say that. Because... Uh, um, yeah, the answer with the Bible is 11th chapter. My wife just came in 11 and 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's all it is. Ain't nothing else. So if, if I look in the scriptures and refer to you, maybe mean something. All it is is what I just told you. So you go to uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 1, and all the way, I go all the way down to the third verse. That's it. It's just a, a, a tool that's used just like love. See, the Bible says faith works by love. So uh, faith, which uh, is what we believe in order to manifest the substance of things hoped for. So it's back to the words. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So it's the piling. So I've, I've gone through this before. That holds up what the word says. That's in you. It's, it's the, uh, a, the, the thinking and the belief inside of you that holds you to maintain, that allows you to maintain the support structure until the Lord brings it from the unseen into the seen. But it's just an entity that's used by God, just like love, just like love. And uh, it, it can't work unless you do what's said in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. So if, if your heart's not filled with the love of God, uh, faith won't work at all. So as far as those kind of people, it, it doesn't work. Huh? So it is, so it is a, a, a frame of mind and condition of the heart. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's it. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. 
If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwoncc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.